Welcome, welcome. Oh, I get a round of applause. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> welcome to everybody in house and everybody online. I only have three announcements. The last time I did announcements, like back in December, Daniel said I took like 10 minutes. So I guess I'm a little chatty. So I'll, I promise not to do that tonight. So I'm just going to get right to it. Okay, so the first announcement is Frontline. The men are going to meet this Tuesday night at John Silva's house. From 6 to 8, from 6 to 7 will be food. He's going to cook some amazing food. He's an awesome chef. <laughs> Woo, there you go. See, you get a round of applause. And um, and then from 7 to 8, they're going to do a Bible study. Are you still doing Daniel? Oh, they're going through the book of Daniel together. So um, anyway, if you need the address, uh, th if you're in-house, they're on the cards on the table in the foyer. If you are online and are interested in joining, send us a text. Or no, not a text, an email at nextstepbiblechurch at gmail.com. All right, that's number one. That didn't take three minutes. I got this. All right. The next one is the men's retreat. So as I'm sure you've heard for the past couple of weeks, we're doing, well, not we because I'm not a man. Um, the church is hosting with Pastor Jeff out of Spokane, Washington, a men's retreat, which is going to be in a town right outside of Spokane called Cusick, I think. Cusick, Washington. Yeah. And anyway, most of our guys are already signed up, I believe, but if there's anybody watching online and you followed us for a while and you want to get to meet this group in person, that would be a great opportunity because you also get to see a beautiful part of the country, learn about God and hang out with some awesome guys. So it's like a win-win-win all the way around. So there again, if you need any more information, the registration can be found on the QR code that is on the screen. And if you have any more, any more questions, you can reach out at nextstepbiblechurch at gmail.com. There we go. We have a thing going here. All right. The last one is about our event that we're going to be doing at Snow White Drive-In that's here in Lebanon. That is going to be Saturday, March the 9th, is it? 9th from 11 to 6. Now, the cool thing about this is it was um, announced as like a small business event, and, but I contacted them and I said, you know, we're not a small business, obviously we're a church. And she's like, come on, be a part of it. So I thought that was really cool. Our agenda, our motivation for doing this is going to be, um, not to sell anything necessarily. It's to just get out in the community, talk to people, witness to people, pray for people, invite people to church, tell people about Jesus, all that good stuff. So you may have seen online, um, Daniel and I started a The Painting Pastor Facebook page, and he's been posting pictures of his artwork. The artwork is what we're going to be selling at the event. Basically, because it is an event to sell, sell things, we had to have something to sell. Um, but that's not our motivation for going there. Anyway, all that to say is if you are in the Lebanon slash Mount Juliet slash Nashville area, on uh, March 9th, please come out and hang out with us for a little while. It's going to be a fun time. Hopefully, we'll have some good weather. And am I, I think I did it in less than 10 minutes. Amen. All right. There you go. All right. We are going to have worship now. So anybody that would like to stand and join us up front, we'd love to have you join us. Man, I felt the presence of the Lord all day today. Um. It's just been amazing. Uh, I'm going to open up in prayer before we get into anything. So join me. Lord Father God, I lift this time up to you. As we get in your word today, may you water us. May you feed us. May you shape us. May you convict us. In Jesus' mighty name, prepare the hearts for, you, for what you have. I'm excited about this new series. I feel like it's anointed. I, f I know that it's anointed. So, Lord, we just invite you into your own house. This isn't our house. Fill this place up with the Holy Spirit to overflow right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. So, anybody see my promo video I did earlier this week? You know what we're signing up to do? <laughs> we're going to start a new series. We're going to do a deep dive in the book of Exodus. Uh, since the year began, we... I've done a good bit of uh, topical messages, and I like to mix it up. I, I just don't want to stick to the same thing over and over and over. I think it's good really just to shake things up and, you know, do some topical messages, but then do get in the Word. This is Next Step Bible Church. 
So we're going to get in God's Word. We're going to get in the Bible. Amen? So you can go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. And the uh, title of today's message is Exodus series number 1, The Detour. I think we have a graphic for that. We're not going to be getting an Exodus here for a couple minutes. Um, There we go. Exodus series, The Detour. I'm going to warn you, uh, next week week will be Exodus series, The Detour Part 2. And I'll explain that in a few. I'm going to start off with a story. Since we're talking about detours, I'm going to talk about a detour that I faced, one of many in my life. I remember I was in my 20s, and uh, me and a bunch of the guys were going to a church function uh, about two hours up the road. And uh, we were all excited. We we're, were young and single, and road trip, road trip. Well, we were doing a caravan kind of thing, and uh, this particular destination had two routes. One route was the highway route, which was your, your, your straight shot, Highway, but it was pretty boring, pretty boring two hour drive. Uh, the other route was a scenic back road route, which added about 20 minutes to the trip. Um, I was in task mode and I wanted to do the straight shot. And I figured, you know, a conversation would would help with the two hour boring drive. But the guy that was riding with me was adamant that we take the scenic route. Oh, and so, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, it's not about me. It's one of those type of situations. And he was pretty adamant. He even said, yeah, I kind of feel in my spirit we're supposed to take the, uh, the scenic route. I'm like, well, I haven't felt anything, but all right, dude, whatever. Well, we got on the road, and the way it worked was you traveled about 20, 25 minutes before you hit the split, where you go to either scenic route or you go the straightaway shot. And for that 20 minutes, <laughs> I remember like it was yesterday. Uh, we were right behind a brand new bright yellow Corvette. And now you have to understand, uh, I'm kind of a car guy. I, I love the engineering that goes into cars and, and, and you know, the horsepower and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just, you know, I'm just a, a man's man. I love cars. And so what was unique about this was Corvette had just come out with a brand new body style. They've been advertising it, and they were teasing people. They wouldn't even release a a sneak peek. They just kept talking about this new performance, this new body style. It was supposed to be awesome. And so this was the first time I actually had laid my eyes on this. I mean, they just had come out like a week before. And we are right behind this brand new. I mean, it was slick. It was awesome. And me and my buddy, we were just like living vicariously through the guy who had just purchased it. I said, man, you know how many horsepower that things have? We're talking, and we're following this Corvette. And it was just cool. I, like I said, I remember it like it was yesterday. Well, I got to admit, when it was time for us to park and go the scenic route, the Corvette went straight. And i like, man, I'm bummed. I thought, man, that'd be kind of cool to travel two hours you know, behind that thing and just, you know. Cool topic of conversation. Well, we take the back road. Well, here's the thing. Knowing that it was going to take 20 minutes longer to get to our destination, uh, we left 20 minutes ahead of the rest of the caravan. We told them, anybody else taking the scenic route? No, we're going straight. Well, I'm like, I wish I could, but whatever. All right, well, we're going to take the scenic route. We're going to go leave 20 minutes ahead of you guys. We should be getting there about the same time. We'll see you when we get to the church. Like, all right. So we took off 20 minutes ahead of them. Well, we reached our destination, the church, and we're excited because it was going to be like this men's uh, gathering, and so it was, it was a guy trip, and uh, we couldn't wait to tell the other guys about the Corvette. Like, man, we saw the new Corvette, and it was awesome. It, 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 it's, uh, it lives up to the hype, how cool this thing looked, and uh, we waited, and we waited, and we waited. None of the caravan had showed up. Like 45 minutes went by, and we're like, man, everybody was at the church. It's not like anybody was late. What's taking them so long? If anything, they probably should have beat us here. I think we stopped a couple times on the scenic route. I think it was a barbecue joint. (laughs) I I had a part of that. Anyway, I digress. But 45 minutes have gone by. All of a sudden, all four other cars come into the 
parking lot. Like, there they are, finally. And they're like, man, you wouldn't believe what happened. I'm like, yeah, you guys are late. Like, man, major accident, fatalities, everything. There was a lumber truck that lost its load, and it took out three cars, and everybody in all three cars died. And you won't believe it. One was a yellow Corvette. I was like, whoa. I was right behind that yellow Corvette. I'd have been in that wreck. I'd have probably been killed. And they were like, no way. Like, no. (laughs) Ask my friend. He goes, oh, yeah, we were for 20 minutes. We were right there next to the Corvette. He said, all the cars that were right there were killed when the truck lost its load. Big trees just, just rolled over and killed everyone. And I remember thinking, thank God. We had to take a detour. Thank God for that detour. You know, I got to admit, (laughs) I was a little frustrated about that detour. Um, (laughs) I I, I tried to be cool with my friend, but inside I was annoyed. I was inconvenienced because of that detour. Well, that's what we're talking about today. The detour. Um, Life has a lot of detours, y'all. A lot of times we get frustrated in the detour. A detour is never in our plans, but most of the time it's in God's plan. God had brought a detour into my life, his route into my life. And there will be times he will bring a detour into your life, his route into your life as well. You always, I always say, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. You need, yeah, I have a plan for this. We have a, an A to Z plan. It's a straight line. And God just laughs. Ha! That's funny. I'm going to put you on a detour. And you, There's going to be valleys. There's going to be hills. There's going to be detours. There's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be all kinds of stuff before you get to your destination. That's just how it goes. Well, today we're beginning a series on the book of Exodus. If you haven't already, go ahead and open your book to that. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. I want to give a preface to this amazing book. As I like to do, I'm a Bible nerd and a book nerd. I geeked out. (laughs) If my teachers in high school heard me say they would laugh, you weren't a nerd in school because you never read. (laughs) Well, I've matured now. I love to be educated. I love to dig into this stuff. So as usual, I said, all right, we're going to get into Exodus. I need to do some digging in Exodus and read. And uh, I asked God, Lord, Reveal some things to me that I never knew before, and he did, and amazing things. We'll get to that in a second. But I want to give a preface on this awesome book we're about to dive into. You may wonder, why does Pastor Dave have his phone up here? Um, I don't have the score of the game on here, I promise. I have a stopwatch. And so I don't preach for three hours unknowingly. Yeah, for real. (laughs) So that's it. Why has he got a phone up there? I have a stopwatch. So (laughs) trust me, it's still not going to slow me down. But (laughs) it does at least... Let me know. I'm going to have an earful on the way home tonight, maybe. But uh, <laughs> Suzanne, they'll go over an hour. People lose their attention when they go over an hour. I know she don't sound like that, but that's how I hear. <laughs> but when you look through the Bible as a whole, through the 66 books, you'll see a story of redemption throughout Scripture. And we'll see that here in Exodus as well. Exodus is one of the f- first five books in the Old Testament. Those five books are called the Pentateuch. Genesis is set up for Exodus. Yeah, you heard that right. Genesis and Exodus are connected. And Genesis sets up Exodus. And part of that connection is a character named Joseph. There are some similarities between Joseph and the Israelites that we'll read about in Exodus. All of that will be revealed in this profound series So let's dig in. Exodus 1, 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, whew, all those 
who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. And then in parentheses it says, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Verse 6, and Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. In other words, it was an end of an era. I'll read that again. And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. You ever had somebody pass away and you go, man, that's the end of an era. For me, that was Andy Griffith. Well, I grew up watching those black and white Andy Griffith shows. I loved Barney Fife and just the whole, the, the whole thing. You know, it's funny looking back on it. Totally side note, just not in my nose. It just hit me. You know, everybody in the Andy Griffith show, all the men, none of them were married. The only one that was married was the drunk that would lock himself in jail. <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> but no, no, think about it. Barney wasn't married. Andy wasn't married. <laughs> Who was the barber's name? Um, Floyd. Floyd. He wasn't married. No one was a happy town. Anyway, no, I'm joking. But no, when Andy Griffith died, I remember thinking, wow. That's an end of an era. I mean, you have to admit, when you, you think back on Mayberry, they were just uh, the purest, truest of times, just good old America, and uh, we lost Andy Griffith. That was the end of an era. Another one I think about was good old John Wayne. He's the rough and tough cowboy guy, and you always think of John Wayne being just, just a man's man. Just <laughs> Nobody's tougher than, than John Wayne, except maybe Chuck Norris, but I digress. But... When, when John Wayne passed away, wow, end of an era. It's the end of an era. Well, this is what's happening here. Joseph, all of his family, all of his brothers, that whole generation passes away, and it's the end of an era. But watch verse 7. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. In other words, there was a new era upon the land. So we have an old era that fades away, passes away, and we're launched into a new era. So this is our passage today, but we won't camp out here long. I got to warn you, there's going to be a lot, and I mean a lot, of text. Because this is a a Bible-driven lesson So we're going to get in the Bible. It's going to be a lot of reading. So put your reading glasses on. (laughs) i got to warn you. And let me explain. Watch this. I told you I did some research. I found something really awesome. And you theologian nerds are going to love this. If you don't know this already. You won't find this in any of the English written Bibles that we have. But in the original Hebrew text... The very first word in the book of Exodus is the word and. And the reason why it's not in our English written Bibles, because it's not grammatically correct. But words have meanings, and you can't start off with something that begins with and. You're like, wait a minute. And means there's something before it. But this is the first word of Exodus. You know what this means? We're going backwards. <laughs> You know, you go to the store and say, I went to the store and I ran into an old friend. You can't just start a sentence, and I ran into my old friend. Well, how? Oh, because I went to the store. Same thing here. So how it should read, verse 1, should read, and now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Well, what's before the and? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's time for some RSE. That's reverse scriptural engineering. It's a term I coined. That's meaning we go backwards in scripture to keep everything we're about to study in context. Amen? All right. So let me see. Look at my notes here. Make sure I'm, yep, there we go. All right, so we're going to back up. Go back to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. And the reason we're doing that is because of verse 6 and 7 that we just read. It says, and Joseph died, all his brothers. So we need to go back and look at Joseph's life, including his brothers. Because this leads us, this launches us from the old era into the new era, which is Exodus. So if we just jumped to this and went straight ahead, it wouldn't do it justice. I want to know the backstory, which will make the other part 
understandable. Amen? All right. So, <laughs> I have in my notes here, I want to I mention this. So, <laughs> when I started my study, it's one of those things where you, you got to give it to God because it's his lesson. I was going to start in Exodus 1 and, move, and just, let's just start forward. And God said, no. <laughs> and, you know, the detour is about, you know, when, when they, you know, we know the story about when they leave Pharaoh and the Israelites take a detour. That's where I was headed with the detour. And he goes, no, I'm going to put a detour in your detour lesson, Danny Bean. <laughs> and we're going to go backwards. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> really? <laughs> so those are kind of some of the behind-the-scenes conversations I have with God. He put a detour in my detour message. Amen. So we're backing up to Genesis 37. And we're going to read 36 verses. And that's not even half of what we're going to read. So I told you, it's going to be a lot of text. Sorry, not sorry. We need to look at the life of Joseph and his brothers so we can understand Exodus. The reason for that is because we're going to see, thanks to Joseph's brothers, that Joseph will endure a major detour in his life, just as the Israelites will hit in Exodus. The old, area, the old era and the new era have some similarities. Plus, we'll see how God causes detours. He does cause, he does allow detours in our life and how he's in the midst of those detours with us. Amen? All right, Genesis 37, 1 through 36. Just as a preface, Jacob is an old man. He's an old geezer. He has 12 sons. And Joseph, our main character, is 17 years old at this time. Joseph was loved by his father more than the rest, and he doesn't even hide it. I think that's kind of funny. And Joseph has favor, and favor isn't fair, as I like to say. So let's read. Verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, I like how they rhyme, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made a tunic, made him a tunic, which is a coat of many colors. Let me talk about this coat real quick. This is something uh, I, I haven't read or studied. It's, I feel like God put this on my heart, so I'm going to share. Um, you know, back in those times, uh, what I do know is when you had a coat, it was usually made of uh, the fur from an animal, which would either be brown or black. That's just how it was. So to have a coat that was many colors, first of all, that had to be custom made because there had to be dyes, uh, implemented on this colorful coat and to order something like that custom made had to be very expensive so all the brothers had a brown or black coat <laughs> and here comes joseph whirling in with a custom made coat of many colors <laughs> he doesn't even hide his favoritism for this kid <laughs> it's just the way it is so Verse 4, but when his brother saw that their lo father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. The father didn't do the son any favors. It says they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. I said it before and I'll say it again. The tongue has the power of life and death. And they could not speak peaceably to him. Be careful how you speak to those that you do not like. Make sure your mouth is as saved as you claim to be. Yes, that may step on some toes. Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And he, hold it, he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. If you don't notice, the brothers' hatred is growing and growing like a volcano. Uh, Grandpa used to say, don't ever waste a good opportunity to keep your mouth shut. But Joseph has a supernatural gift of interpreting dreams, which will benefit him later in his life. But here's the deal. Not everybody's going to be excited about your gift 
that God has blessed you with. Especially your family and your close friends. Your gift is a calling. You would think others would be happy for you to walk in your calling. No, not always. (laughs) The Apostle Paul tells us that we need to be careful and walk worthy of our calling. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2 says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling with which you were called, with lowliness and gentleness. That means in humility. Because you know, you might have an awesome gift, but you don't need to go showing it off to everybody because then pride enters and then we have a problem. I think this is what's going on with Joseph. Joseph was proud of his gift. And now... You, realize that Joseph is 17. He's a kid. (laughs) You remember when you're 17? You ever said or did something so stupid when you're 17? You look back on and you just cringe. Oh boy, I have a list. Oh, should not have ever said that. That was so hurtful. That was rude. That was selfish. I shouldn't have done that. What was I thinking? And then you're like, all right, I was 17. I was immature. I I was out. Man, cringeworthy. Anybody ever done that? Don't raise your hand or don't elbow your spouse. But I think Joseph here, I think that he was excited about his gift and he missed the opportunity to just keep it to himself because he just wanted to share. (laughs) Verse 6. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. (laughs) I'm sure all the brothers are like, great. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheave arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheave stood all around and bowed down to my sheave. (laughs) Oh, he's not doing himself any favors, is he? (laughs) Oh, boy. Verse 8, and his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion, which is authority, over us? So they hated him even more. I have that even more part underlined. For his dreams and for his words. Let me explain why this is an insult in that culture. Because the oldest son was to be the heir of the family and represent the family name. He was the alpha brother because of his birthright. Joseph, however, was the youngest of the clan. He was at the bottom of the totem pole. Eleven brothers would have to die in order for Joseph to become the heir. You see why this doesn't make sense and how it's offensive? Not only was this impossible, it was insulting to the other eleven brothers that they would have to bow to their baby brother. It doesn't work like this. So when he shared this, it, it, first of all, it ticked him off. Second of all, did he make sense? Like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> Verse 9, then he dreamed still another dream. Great. And he told it to his brothers. Another great opportunity that he missed to be quiet. And said, look, I have dreamed another dream. <laughs> I can just imagine brothers looking at each other. Really? <laughs> you want to beat him up or you want me to beat him up? But he's dad's favorite, so we got to be careful. Dad's always watching. Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time, watch this. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. (laughs) What? The moon, the sun. Oh, I'm Joseph. Everybody's going to bow down to me. You notice I said 11 stars because there's 12 brothers. (laughs) Well, it just gets worse and worse. So he told it to his father and his brothers. Watch this. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Oh, you can. (laughs) That just sounds like the father is mad, offended, and upset. And his brothers envied him. That's a nice word. That's a nice way to put it. I, I think they hated him more than envied him. But it says his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. You know what that means? It means his dad was chewing on what he had just heard. Like, what in the world is going on with my boy? Why would he say such nonsense? He had a dream. 
He has a gift of interpreting dreams. What does this mean, God? And said he kept it in the matter in mind. I think he chewed on it for a while. Verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. Well, this shows that Joseph was obedient. And God loves an obedient posture. Amen? He said, I need to send you. He goes, Okay, here I am. Verse 14. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. I love this part. You know why? Because I can just imagine a 17 year old wandering in a field. All right. You got to realize they don't have cell phones. He's going to look for his brother and their flock, the brothers in the flock. <laughs> He's wandering around looking for them. <laughs> probably looks lost. He's probably lollygagging because he's a 17-year-old. La, 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 la. This guy sees him, says, hey. <laughs> a certain man found him. He's like, hey, you know, get off my lawn, kid. <laughs> but this guy's like, get out of my pasture. <laughs> he found him wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what, what are you seeking? Like, bro, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> I just love that part. So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. I guess there's nothing going around, going around there. So when somebody's feeding the flock, people just know about it. And the man said, they have departed from here. And I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now, when he saw him, no, when they saw him far afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Okay, this is something new for me. I asked the Lord, you know, I've read this a gazillion times. Uh, show me some new things. He said, okay, I want to show you some new things going on here. Uh, since we are a church of deliverance ministry, um, let's not overlook the spiritual activity going on with the brothers and the brothers here in Scripture. I'm like, all right, Lord, that, that's a good one. Watch this. Just by reading this, I see a spirit of anger amongst the brothers. I see a spirit of bitterness and jealousy. I see a spirit of death. They want to kill him. A spirit of hatred. They, they loathe this brother. Let's make sure we read Scripture through kingdom eyes, fully aware of the spiritual realm that goes on around us. I think too many believers bypass that. We have to always be sensitive to the spiritual warfare that's going on all around us all the time. And when you're in Scripture, start looking at it and reading it with those eyes, knowing that there's spirits that go around jumping on people. So here we go. We have brothers, I believe, that have spirits on them. And I think it's pretty evident. The Lord revealed that to me. I'm like, well, thank you, Lord. That is new. Verse 19, then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. Well, we can now throw the spirit of lies and deception into the mix. And it says, we shall see what will become of his dreams. The reason why I know that's a, a spirit is because, is because Satan is a dream killer. He's a dream destroyer. He wants to devour your dreams, your plans, and your goals. He does not want you to thrive whatsoever. So Joseph comes along. Obviously, he's a godly kid because he has God's favor on him. And he has this gift of interpreting dreams that is a gift from God. And he's fully aware of it. And I think it arouses the spirits on these brothers. I always say, the Holy Spirit in you will irritate the spirits on those around you. And I think that's exactly what's going on right here. But watch this. Verse 21. But Reuben heard it. I like Reuben. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. So Reuben, the oldest of the brothers, literally saves Joseph's life right there. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, 
that he might deliver him out of our hands and bring him back to his father. Verse 23, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Why did they take his tunic? You know, if they really want to humiliate him, they could have just taken all of his clothes and <laughs> made him naked and get in the pit naked. That would humiliate him. No, nope, let's just take that coat. Why the coat? I think it's because what the coat represented. To them, that coat was a reminder that he was favored and loved over them. Ooh, they hated that coat. They hated that coat. I think they were bitter towards their father because he'd give them that custom-made fancy coat. In other words, here, boys, all you can have a, a horse. <laughs> Joseph, <laughs> you get a Ferrari. <laughs> mm. That's basically what happened if we were to make that into modern day times. Mm -mm -mm. Verse 24, they took him and cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. This part's important to me. This shows me a lot of things right here. This shows us they had plenty, time, plenty of time to contemplate their actions towards their brothers. Let, let, let's make a meal, cook up some grub. There was plenty of time there for them to come to their senses and go, you know, this isn't going to pan out very well. What are we thinking? <laughs> let's pull him out of the pit. We scared him. We, you know, maybe he'll chill out. Mm -mm. It says, and they sat down to eat a meal. You know, stuff's in the scripture for a reason. It says, then they lifted their eyes and looked. <laughs> and there was a company of Ishmaelites. <laughs> coming from Gilead with their camel, camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? <laughs> we can make money off this dude. Verse 27, Come, let us sell him to Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. Talk about rationalization at its finest. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. <laughs> In other words, hey, you got a good point. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Watch this. Verse 29, then Reuben returned to the pit. And indeed, Joseph was not in the pit and he tore his clothes. So obviously, Reuben wasn't around when this transaction took place. I don't know if he was out hunting, gathering food, maybe getting some firewood for the food. I don't know what, but he wasn't there when all this went down. So when he comes back, <laughs> my man's gone. He's like, oh, no, and he freaks out. It says, then Reuben returned to the pit and indeed, Joseph was not in the pit. He tore his clothes. That's how they grieved back then. When you grieved, you tore your clothes in grief. This shows me that Reuben actually loved Joseph, or he wouldn't have grieved. Verse 30 says, And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more. And I, where shall I go? In other words, I don't have to go back to dad and explain what happened. Reuben was distraught. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? That's a loaded question. You know why? Because that was a custom, one-of-a-kind made coat. <laughs> they, there weren't many coats going around with all these colors. Everybody wore brown or black fur skin. But not Joseph. Joseph had the Ferrari. It's like bringing a crashed Ferrari. He goes, you think this is your son's? Oh, you think? Duh. Of course it is. They knew it. That was a loaded question. Yeah. Verse 33, and he recognized it and said, it's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Can you imagine how distraught Jacob was. 
I mean, he loved this kid. This kid was the miracle kid. I mean, he didn't even hide that it was his fa- he was his favorite. Verse 34, then Jacob, Jacob tore his clothes. There's that grief. Put on sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. Oh, it was so bad watching 35. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dad is bad off. Even the brothers might be going, oh, man, <laughs> we took things way too far. All the sons and all the daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. In. And he said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Wow. That had to break all of their hearts. It says, thus his father wept for him. Mm. Have you ever been so sad and so broken? You just wanted to die. I have. There's been times like, you know, (laughs) I'm just better off gone. I cannot handle what's on my plate. I cannot. That's how Jacob was feeling. Poor guy. Verse 36, now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar. This Potiphar dude's a pretty cool dude. He's an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. This guy's a big deal. So Joseph is sold to Potiphar. This is a huge detour in Joseph's life. One minute, you're the golden child of the family. Life is great. You want for nothing. You're spoiled rotten by your parents. And the next thing you know, you're a slave. <laughs> Joseph said, what is going on? Really, God? You know, we all have detours that hit our life. And it might be one of those really God moments. That's what Joseph is facing right here. It was culture shock. He was far from home. His awesome jacket's gone. Uh, Now he's owned by somebody. He's a slave. You can have much more of a bigger detour than that. Now, let's skip a chapter for time's sake and jump over to chapter 39. Chapter 39. We're doing pretty good on time. I have a subtitle in my Bible, and it says, Joseph, a slave in Egypt, chapter 39. We're talking about this detour. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So don't miss this. Even though Joseph's life has taken a different route in life than he had expected, God was still with him. Just because you hit a detour in life does not mean God has abandoned you. Too many people I see when they hit the detour, they feel like God has abandoned them. No, this is why this is in Scripture. It may feel like God has abandoned you, but it isn't so. That's a lie from the enemy asking you, where's your God now? Get behind me, Satan. Mm. Even in the detour, praise the Lord. Even in the bad times, he's still a good God. Amen? Oh. Watch verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. There we go. (laughs) There we go. I kind of set that up on purpose. Joseph hits a detour. But watch this. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. What? Even during the detour? Yeah. He was still successful. Hmm. There's favor. That's the favor that I talk about. When you're obedient, favor comes into your life. Because God can trust you. I did a message a long time ago that was titled, Can God Trust You With Favor? Because he's got to be able to trust you with that favor. Because that favor comes uh, responsibility. It takes faith and obedience to acquire that. That's what's going on here. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. In other words, he had favor. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3. 
And now his master saw that the Lord was with him. That's huge. <laughs> you ever just observe somebody? You just kind of watch them? You're like, man, God's all over that person. I mean, just, they, they're just a spiritual powerhouse. They walk in authority. And you, you admire them? You're like, man, I want to get to that someday. Oh, I've had so many people in my life that I looked up to like that. Oh, spiritual powerhouse. Whew, if I could just have a fraction of that, it'd be awesome. You can see that on people. That's what happened here. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. What a witness. <laughs> people are always watching what we do. They're always listening to what we say. Oh, we do so much and say so much that tarnish our witness. How about we turn that around and just walk in purity and righteousness and authority and people are like, whoa, man. And you don't have to, you don't have to talk about it. You just walk in it and people will see it. This is what Joseph, Joseph didn't go around bragging, you know, what an awesome godly man he was. No, he could see it. <laughs> Potiphar saw it. And the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did prosper in his hand. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. I love that part, that served part. We should always, always have a servant's heart. I don't care how big of a title you have. If you're not willing to, to wash feet, you're not deserving of any titles. I'm all about leading by example. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. Yeah, let's make this a, a modern day thing. Basically, he became uh, the manager of the house or of the estate, let's just say, because this is a high roller here. He's a manager over an estate. <laughs> it means you manage everything, dude. And, and, and to make it uh, modernized, he, he had a key to the front door. He had a key to every door in the house. He, he had the bank account information. He had a, the, 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 the guy's personal debit card, or maybe a credit card. He had all of it. He was trusted with all of it. He was a manager of the house of, or of the estate. <laughs> wow. Woo. Verse 5. So it was for the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, Ooh. that the Lord bless the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Stop right there. <laughs> Did you guys catch that? Just because Joseph was in the house, just because Potiphar was in his presence, Potiphar's house was blessed. Potiphar was blessed. Everything around Joseph was blessed. It was like so much good fruit. It was just falling off the limbs and people were just grabbing up and eating it. All this fruit, even those around him were blessed. Do not miss that. You know why? Be careful who you hang out with. You might hang out with somebody that's awesome favor. And guess what? Some of it rubs off on you too. I'm not saying that's why you be a friend. It's just a consequence of having good godly friends. And likewise, they hang out with you. Some of your good fruit falls off the limbs and blesses them. So it was from that time he made him overseer of the house, verse 5. Overseer of his house and all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. <laughs> Everything in this estate was blessed because of the person who just walked up and entered the house. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Verse th 6. Thus he left all that he had, watch this, in Joseph's hand, watch this, and did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. You know how big that is? <laughs> hey, Joseph, how much money is in the account? 2.8 million? I praise the Lord. Hey, how much grain we got in the, in the, in the back? 40. Oh, enough for six months. Praise the Lord. He don't even know. Joseph knows. He's running everything. He's in charge of everything. This guy don't even know, except what the bread in front of him. That's a big deal. <laughs> There's a lot of big deals in this message, amen? Oh, remember, all this is during the detour, by the way. All this, is, this Joseph didn't have any of this planned for his life. But now this is his life. 
And God's blessing him in the detour. God is always with you in the detour. Don't forget that. Somebody in here or somebody online needs to hear that. You're going through a tough time. You're going to detour. And you feel like God is nowhere around. Always there. He's there. Says, then he left, verse 6, then he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Watch this next part. I think it's funny. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. I love that they put that part in there. <laughs> this was a good looking dude. It says in appearance, so his face was good looking, but in form. This dude had abs, he had pecs, he was built. <laughs> He was a stud. Can I say that in the pulpit? Whatever. That dude was a stud. Sorry, not sorry. Why do they say that? Because very next verse, verse 7, watch. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Now, I'm sure she didn't want to cuddle. Lie with me. She was seducing him. Uh, possible Jezebel spirit. Now we start looking at this through those eyes. You know, Jezebel's a spirit of seduction. I think we're dealing with a, a Jezebel here. But he refused and said to his master's wife, watch this. Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I. Ooh. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. Basically, he has access to everything but her, the forbidden fruit. Hmm. Unlike Adam, Joseph has wisdom and discernment and does not fall to the evil tempter. Mm. Isn't it funny how Satan always shows up? Things are going great. He's been promoted to the manager of the estate. Once again, let's make this modern day times. It's kind of like a rich guy. He's off the work. He's a workaholic. He's gone all the time. He has a beautiful wife because he's rich. But there's this pool boy that shows up that's good looking with abs and he's ripped. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, that pool boy looks pretty good. I think I'll try to seduce him. My bull boy, whose name is Joseph, is on to her. And he walks away. I love that. This is, let me read verse 9 again. There is no one greater in the house, because I only read the first part. I want to read the second half now. There is no one greater in the house than I, nor has he kept any kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife watch this how then can i do this great wickedness and sin against god whoa right there you see his post his posture he didn't say how can i sin against my master how can i sin against potiphar he said no how can i sin against god Ooh, you know why? Because he knows all that favor he knows all this stuff during the detour is not coming from potiphar it's coming from god and he knows God is using Potiphar to elevate him. Oh, that's so big right there. <laughs> How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Ooh. Oh, I bet that, that stirred Jezebel up. I'm sure it did. How dare he turn me down? Oh. Verse 10. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. That shows us the temptations were nonstop, day by day by day by day. That he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. <laughs> he was shutting that girl down left and right. And I'm sure she was hot. It's Potiphar's wife. I mean, <laughs> so how it works in this world. You have, you have status, you have power, you have money. You got arm candy. But he turned her down. He wasn't falling for it. Verse 11, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. In other words, there were no witnesses. Ruh -roh. You be careful with that. Verse 12, 
that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So she grabs something, a shirt, jacket, whatever, and he bolts out. But when he bolts out, she's still holding it. Ah, (laughs) we have ourselves an opportunity here. Verse 13, and it was so when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called out, called to the men in her house and spoke to them saying, see, he, he has brought to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice, liar, liar. Verse 15, and it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. Uh, Joseph has been blackmailed. Verse 16, so she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Uh Uh-oh. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Don't blame the guy. Verse 20, then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. Joseph goes from hero to zero instantly. Yet another detour. (laughs) Joseph has a detour within the detour. (laughs) Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. Catch that? No matter how many detours this poor guy goes through, the Lord was with him. No matter how many detours you go through, the Lord is with you. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. (laughs) No matter where this guy goes, he gets favor. No matter where this guy goes, because of his obedience and his faith, he's elevated every time, every time. Some of us need to take notes on that. Because at least a little thing goes wrong. Oh, man, the whole world's coming to an end. No, praise the Lord. He's there with you. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Are you kidding me? The same thing that happened in Potiphar's house. He was elevated and put in charge over everything. He gets thrown to prison. The guy sees God all over him. He says, whoa, you have the Lord with you. I'm going to elevate you and put my trust in you. Probably put his job on the line. You're over everything, everybody and everything in this prison. Boom. He's at the top again. <laughs> Verse 23, and the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. You know, that shows absolute trust. And Joseph, when you walk with character and integrity, even those that are put over you will respect that. They will honor that because people are always watching. They're always listening. It says, because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The whole time God made sure Joseph prospers no matter what his circumstance no matter what his circumstance. All right, we're going to stop right there. That's our, that's our text. I told you there's a lot of text, but that's okay. This is a Bible message. This is a Bible series. We're going to be in a lot of Bible. So I wanted to stop right there, and we're going to do detour part two next week uh, when we get the king involved, and there's dreams to be interpreted and all of that. So, We'll we'll be in uh, detour part two next week. But this week, uh, I wanted to stop here. It's a good stopping point and talk about application. Application is what we take from what we've learned today, what we've read today. And how do we apply it to our lives? What does this look like to us? So I have four points. Point number one, detours have a purpose. 
Point number one, detours have a purpose. Most of the time, if not all of the time, you will never understand the purpose of your detour until after you've gone through it. You know why? Because you're going to need faith to get through it. If you knew what it was going to look like at the end, you wouldn't require any faith. That's not how God works. God wants us to walk through the wilderness in faith. Even when times are tough, no matter how bad the storm gets, you know, how far off track your detour takes you off of your plan, there's a purpose to it. Just like the t- detour I spoke about earlier, that detour most likely saved my life. God had a plan for my life. He put it on my friend's heart. Let's take the scenic route. <laughs> Thank God. I'm like, okay, I didn't argue it. I, you know, whatever. Man, that probably saved my life, that detour. The, one that, the detour that inconvenienced me, the detour that kind of uh, put me in a little bit of a bad mood, <laughs> if I'm honest. I wanted to do it my way. But no, trying to be a good friend. Boy, there was a purpose for that detour in my life. Amen? There are things we learn in the detour. There's pruning in the detour. There is spiritual elevation during the detour. Our faith is stretched. Our obedience is tested. There's a lot that goes on in that detour. Once we understand that there is a blueprint in heaven, and there is, with your name on it, we will embrace the detour. That's the one thing you need to learn tonight. There's a blueprint in heaven with your name on it. And once we know that, no matter where God takes us, no matter how far off of our plans it is, as long as we trust in Him, then we'll learn to embrace the detour. In other words, when things start going crazy, you know what, Lord? Not my will, but your will be done. I don't understand it. It's not what I really signed up for, but if this is where you're taking me, okay. I just know that you're a good God, no matter how crazy things get. Embrace the detour. We gain so much during the detours in life. We'll experience successes. We'll experience failures. There will be tests to overcome. I always say you don't have a testimony without the test. So he's building on a whole repertoire of testimonies during your detour. You'll experience divine appointments in your detour. Dan and I were talking about that earlier. Imagine all the different divine appointments in your life that led you right here t- today. It's amazing. We can go back to that appointment, to that appointment, to that restaurant, to that meeting, to that coffee shop. Boom, 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 boom. Wow. All that was part of the detour. That was all part of the plan. <laughs> so you'll experience divine appointments in your detour. You'll go through experiences and situations that will shape you and mold you. Your character will be developed during a detour. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We live in a microwave society. I want what I want and I want it now. That's not how it works in God's economy. That's how it works in the world's economy. Two different economies. In the weeks to come, we'll see how God used a detour in Joseph's life in order to place him right where God wanted him and needed him to be. We'll get to that later. Point number two. Detours can be a blessing in disguise. I'm going to ask my wife, Suzanne, to come up. Detours can be a blessing in disguise. At the moment you hit a detour in life, it might not make sense. You you might just so so wrapped up in, in this new change in your life, you can't even see straight or think straight. Well, Suzanne's going through that, and I asked her to, to share point number two and how detours can be a blessing in disguise. Yeah, as soon as he asked me to do this, I was like, great. I always cry when I tell the story. I'm, I'm counting on that. <laughs> yeah, you can put me on the spot. Okay, so what he's referring to is... See, I'm going to start crying already. <laughs> I haven't all right. said it yet. That's all right. My first husband passed away. Um, we had been together for 10 years. We had three little kids, a four-year-old little girl and twin boys that had just turned a year old. 
and he was doing yard work in the backyard, and he just dropped dead. They said that he most likely died before he hit, his, hit the ground because his hands were not in front of him. His hands were off to the side. Turns out, through an autopsy, I found out that he had a rare heart disease that we never knew about. But I kind of feel like that in itself was a blessing because then he, he would have shut down and it wouldn't have been good. But anyway, so for the longest time, I viewed that day, understandably, as like the worst day of my life. But as time went on and I went through the grieving process and I started to heal and put my life back together in a whole new way than it had been before, and I was a different person than I was before, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then I met him, and I came to realize that not only was that the worst day of my life, it was actually also the best day of my life. Because Dale and I were happily married, and we would have continued to be happily married. <laughs> but I can't imagine not being married to him now. And I feel like that was just part of the process. God knew that Dale needed me for that time. Because we had a happy marriage, and we, our time together was probably the happiest decade of his life. And so I was able to give that to him before he passed. And here I am, a single mom with three little kids, and he wanted a big family. And he's like, boom, instant family. He loved every minute of it. So as I healed, and I look back on that situation, like he was saying earlier, sometimes you don't see the, the benefit of the detour where you're in the middle of it. But I look back on it and I go, wow, in a weird way, that was the worst day of my life and the best day of my life because I'm married to him now. And I wouldn't have had the opportunity to be married to him if Dale hadn't passed away. So it's just one of those things where God works everything together for his glory. Mm -hmm. And my children got to grow up with a father, mm -hmm. which was a huge blessing. And anyway, I think that's it. Is that yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. Hey, you can turn it off. I'm just going to leave that at point number two because I can't top or add anything else to that. But detours can be a blessing in disguise. A lot of times, like I said, it doesn't make sense when we're in the detour. But then when we arrive to the destination, the plan that God has for us, then it makes sense. I can't imagine not being married to Suzanne and being a father to Evan Owen and McKenna. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the weird thing is she has twins, and my whole life I prayed to have twins. And I thought, wow, that, that ship has sailed. And then I met her, and she goes, I have twins, by the way. I'm like, now you're showing off, God. Now you're showing off. He goes, yeah, I know. Anyway, let's bring the, the plane to the landing strip. I have two more points I want to hit. I think I'm going to be able to keep this under an hour. Ha, ah, praise the Lord. Point number three, detours expose your faith or lack thereof. Mm. Detours expose your faith. Detours will show everyone around you what you're made of, good or bad. The first is how strong your faith is. Some people rise in times like this. Others crumble under the weight. We should walk boldly in our faith at all times. That's what we should shoot for. Like I said, even when things are bad, God is still good. God is still on the throne. He's still large and in charge. And we should always hold on to that. In fact, especially in times like that, when you hit a detour, hold on to that. Stand on that. Some have a lack of faith when a detour shows up in their life. And that displeases the Lord. Because in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Boy, that word impossible is a, whoo, that's heavy. It didn't say sometimes or most times. No, it is impossible to please God without faith. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. There's an old saying that goes, when things go wrong, don't go with them. Too many times things start going wrong, we go right with it. There's a pity party. We have a meltdown. Uh, we freak out. We get depressed. We get sad. We should be doing the opposite. We should be seeking the Lord, praising the Lord, worshiping our way through the situation. When things go bad, don't go with them. And I know that's easier said than done. 
But let's try to live by that. See, too many Christians talk a good game. They know all the key words in Christianese. They got the bumper sticker. They got the whole thing. But let them lose their job or some other unplanned detour and watch how they react. Where's your faith? Wow, this this godly person that talks about God all the time, something happens, boom, you have a meltdown. Where's your God? Come on, where's your faith? Joseph never loses faith in his detour. He never cusses the Lord or shakes his fist at him in anger. Joseph rises to the occasion every single time. And God honored Joseph's faith with favor, as we just read today. Point number four, detours prepare you. Oh, this is the biggest one. There's so much we learn in the detour. It prepares us. There are just some things in life that you cannot conquer until you've been prepared. There are assignments that the Lord will want you to accomplish, but you won't be able to tackle it until you are prepared, until you're ready. God might be preparing you, growing you, strengthening you for your assignment and for your calling, and He's using a detour to do that. Maybe the calling God has for you is too big for you in this moment. Maybe He's preparing you for that. He's building you. If He was to give it to you right now, you couldn't handle it. That's why He he puts you through a detour sometimes. You need to go through some stuff first. You're going to need some battle scars first. The best believers on the planet, the most Powerful spiritual thoroughbreds, I know, walk with a limp. They've been through some stuff. They've been through some wars. There's battlegrounds that they've had to cover before they could get into a pulpit or lead something. They walk with a limp. They fought the devil on so many levels. And they walked away a victor, but they still got a limp. Now, small things that used to trip them up, don't even phase them anymore because they've been through some stuff. Maybe God is toughening you up. Maybe he, He's getting you battle ready. So when that battle does come, you're, you, you may have some battle scars. You may even have a limp. Detours prepare you. In conclusion, detours are never, ever fun. They come with pain. Just ask Suzanne. They come with disappointment. They come with tears. Sometimes it comes with loneliness and sadness. You may come out of the other side with a limp, but you're still walking. See, I might have a limp, but baby, I'm still walking. The devil's beat me up a few times. He's got some good, good uh, punches in on me. That's all right. I still am victorious. I might have some battle scars and I might have a limp, but I'm still walking. Amen? We need to walk like that. The devil might have gotten a piece of you, but he didn't get all of you. And, all of you, and as long as you can still walk, you can still fight. If he be for me, who can be against me? Amen? If he be for me, who can be against me? You need to quote that next time you find yourself in a detour. If he be for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah. God's in control. God knows the plan. Trust in him. Amen. Father God, we're thankful for today's message. Oh, I love the word. (laughs) So good. Your word is better than any movie we can watch. I pray that you've touched some hearts tonight. There might be some people watching online or even here that are in a detour. And it's just not making sense. They really don't feel your presence. So Lord, maybe through this, they know you are with them in the detour. You're with Joseph every time. 
And you showed him favor and mercy in the detour. You will show us mercy and favor in our detours. Man, just as I'm speaking right now, I'm thinking of multiple major detours in my life. I'm not going to bring them up, but I know, I, I, I see how you worked in those challenging times. How you showed up, I see favor that led me to my destination. I would have never arrived to if I didn't go through that detour. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for detours. As inconvenient and painful as they are, thank you, Lord. Oh, you grew me so much in my detours. You shaped me so much in my detours. Thank you, Lord. It's because of my detours. I'm in this pulpit today. I had no idea, no plan to ever be a pastor, Father God. But you did. You knew all along, throughout my whole life, all the craziness I've been through, all the bad decisions I've made, all the abuse I've gone through, you knew all that was part of your plan. That led me right here today to this moment. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I pray that my life is a testimony to others. But I had to go through the test first. So, Lord, continue to water us with your word. Feed us with your word. Mold us and shape us with your word. Convict us with your word. I'm so excited about this Exodus series. I pray you continue to peel the onion in a supernatural way as I dig into it. And we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for how much you love us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. We just love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Ooh. I feel the Holy Spirit up in this place. I love uh, this next part where we get to pray. I want to invite all of you online. Uh, when we turn off here in a few minutes, spend some time in prayer. Spend some time uh, chewing on this text that we went over today. Meditate in it. Think about it. Ask God to show you some things. Reveal some things. Just because we turn the camera off doesn't mean that, that you have to stop worshiping wherever you're watching from. So I want to dismiss the online crowd at this point. I love you guys. Please tune in next week for uh, the Exodus series. The Detour Part 2. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. God bless, and I will see you next week.